Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Henry Schein Dental Academy webinar series. My name is Adam, Marketing Specialist, and I'll be your moderator. We are excited to welcome Dr. Payman Racy, aka Dr. Pay Ray, as our speaker tonight, as he will review how he uses photography and smile design to deliver full arch restorations. Before we get started, I have a few reminders for you. At any point during tonight's webinar, we do encourage your participation through the chat and Q&A features. Please type any questions you might have into the Q&A section of your control panel, and we will answer them live at the end of the presentation. And Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending tonight's presentation live or on demand. Dr. Payray, welcome back to the Henry Schein webinar program. We're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. And thank you to the Henry Schein team to uh, invite me for another presentation, which is actually the first of many to come this year. And I'm super excited to be working with you, Adam, Andrea, and a lot of um, good folks at Henry Schein to be able to bring this to, um, to the computers and laptops and iPhones of so many people to be able to watch these things and learn and share and, and be able to network is still at the times of where it's hard to meet in person. So thank you for that. Um, this is actually one of my very favorite topics when it comes to photography and smile design is something that I, I love, especially the photography part. And I kind of tell you my journey going through this whole um, photography, learning, taking how to take pictures and, um, and then the smile design. So when it comes to a full mouth reconstruction, it, it's a very, it's a very uh, popular topic. It's a favorite amongst us. And, and, and especially nowadays with, amount of technology and so many things that are coming out every day and making our lives easier. And for dentistry and for us, it's so important to be able to learn how to use and how to utilize all these technologies to be able to be more predictable. Um, the opportunity to go all in and recreate somebody's smile, um, it's, a, it's a tough thing. I mean, there's so many different parts. There's so many things that are going on. So. Um, it, and it's just not their smile, but it's somebody's the whole entire appearance, you know, and, and that's why um, full arch dentistry encompasses many, many disciplines in dentistry from going from uh, implants to removable to fixed and to full mouth cosmetic crowns. And with all that, there's so many things that we could use in our fingertips these days. And one of those things that I love dearly from the moment I started practicing and as a, after I graduated is using photography. And now I'm more and more using the smile design to deliver uh, full arch cases. So let's get into, um, let me go ahead and next. So this is a little, um, I'm not gonna talk, this is more my, I don't wanna brag about myself kind of resume to summarize it. I graduated University of Tennessee, 2014. I, um, I started, I built my practice 2016, but 17 is when I really started working January 17. So it's almost, it's five years, it's the fifth year. So four years, I opened my lab, gosh, I don't know why, but, two years ago, and that's been another whole another experience. And so much I've learned over the past two years um, of being able to make teeth. I never thought of myself this quickly wanted to build a lab. And that's a whole another conversation for another lecture. But today um, we'll talk some of that about the lab and what do I do. Um, I do co-host Millennial Dennis Podcast, um, also a co-founder of Dental Influencers Alliance or DIA Conference, which is I'm super excited about this year. A DIA 3.0 is in Atlanta. It's going to be awesome and uh, can't, can't wait to meet so many of you guys because I've got a lot of folks from Instagram that told me that they're going to be on here. And this is a, a DIA is a great place to meet everybody. And I'm, I can't wait for this year's. And so if you haven't really... Um, heard about DIA, I definitely encourage you to go to influencedentistry.com and, and check out the website and see the past events. I also teach all on X stuff on the, on the, in the office in a more ultimate, like an intimate, I say ultimate and intimate setting. In the office, I have my team to go over the marketing stuff and I have um, uh, my front desk to go over what do we do, how do we make the website, They're like everything because it's not just the full arch where you go and 
throw implants and make somebody smile, but it's so many more aspects of things that need to be uh, synchronized. And so when I do those courses, I like to also have team members like assistants. So my assistants teach my other assistants. Then I have technicians, my dental tech teach other dental techs. And then uh, of course we do the all on X live courses. So that's another thing I started doing. We've got four or five courses, I think four to be exact. And um, they were all uh, amazing, sold out in the first couple of hours. So it was grateful. I'm very happy for that. And I'm gonna do, uh, have a couple more courses. I'm sure this year with all the pandemic and stuff is kind of hard, but um, also check out my website, drperry.com to learn more, but without further ado, let's get started and spend two minutes introducing myself. So let's go today. These are some of the things on the left. If you see the why, the why is super important for me with everything. And I'll go over why the photography and why is it so important right now for anybody that is listening today to get a camera. If you're not, a, you, if you don't have a camera, you're not regularly take pictures. I'll show you why you need to get on that. Then equipments, I'm gonna go over equipments and I'm gonna simplify this because photography, I'm gonna make, uh, go over the body camera lens um, flashes and, ex and, and all the accessories, what I use. Then I'm gonna go over the camera settings. Those are some of the most boring stuff that nobody really likes to talk about. So I tried my best to make it simple and super very, very quickly, you can kind of figure out and you be on your own uh, playing with manual and doing all kinds of stuff. So I have some sort of technique where it helped me to be able to take pictures. So I have those. Then I'm gonna introduce you to um, a series of templates that I created, 567 PCI. I'll go over that. Um, then I'm gonna show you some practical application. I'm gonna take some pictures and I'll show you how we correct them and give you some photography tips. Those are amazing tips. And then I'm gonna get into the smile design stuff and show you how um, by cases. So I'll show you a bunch of cases and how we, how, how did we deliver these full mouth restorations using photography that I'm going to go over and using the smile design. So, um, for the next hour, hour and a half, be a, like, start right taking notes and be ready because I'm super excited to be sharing this stuff. It's the first time I'm doing this photography on, um, in this scale. So, what you're going to be able to really get out of this is going to be start taking high quality pictures right off the bat um, in your office. Another thing, other than things that I wrote down here in terms of what you're going to gain, the main thing is you have to set a tone in your office and that this is a new workflow. This is going to have to be a, a something that comes from the most authoritative figure in the office that needs to be whoever it is that has to be photography has to be a part of the workflow with no exceptions. And this is what I'm going to you're going to learn how to go about it and how to make it work. Um, and then also I'm gonna, you're going to learn a little bit about communicating with your lab. It's not just implant cases. So if you're not doing a ton of full mouth implants, it's also for cosmetic crowns because gosh, there's so many things you could do with the smile design and pictures to be able to predictably make sure whatever you design can come exactly like that in the computer to your patient's mouths. And I'm super excited to be sharing a step-by-step -step on that. So let's take a minute to watch this. Okay, big reveal. Oh, wow. Oh my gosh, Clemmy. Wow. So what you didn't see is what you're gonna be able to see after um, when we get towards the end. So what happens in here? Now the why, I always like to include this in my, um, this book in my lectures because it has influenced me so much because it all really starts with the why. If you haven't read that book by Simon Sinek, he's one of my role models, I love him. He's like, not like that, you know, but just like, I love his style. I read his books and one of the, my favorites uh, starts with why. And for this lecture, the why makes sense. And that's because for why did somebody choose me to come to my practice to be able to, for me to be given them teeth? And then why did they move forward with the treatment plan? So why did they choose me and why did they move forward? Those two questions, I always like to know, I always want to say photography lies 
in the answer to those two questions. Photography is a big deal. And I think a lot of times that I got acceptance was really the photos that people told me about and so many different ways um, that you put yourself out there. So somewhere between the first and second question, again, the, I wanna answer it in this lecture of why photography is really the root of both of those answers to the questions of why did they choose me and why did they move forward? Um, year is 2014, so I graduated dental school and I get into this practice of uh, full math dentures and it was just dentures for a minute. And, and what was crazy was I would see these people come through and get dentures and come with horrible teeth, so, so poor uh, perio, so much mobility. So they never seen dentists, some of them in years and be able to give them teeth such a quick time and like immediate dentures. It changed their lives in, in, in such a way that when I saw them in post-op, you can start seeing the changes. And that was just let alone dentures, nothing else. And that was when, as soon as I got out, I honestly got a camera. There was a camera in the office that was never used. So then I, instead of going and buying a brand new one right off the bat, I went and got my, um, let me move my thing over here, it's better. So I went and got, um, I started taking pictures. So the other day I was preparing for this lecture. I'm gonna go on, I went on Dropbox and I'm looking at these photos. So I was like, let me just show them what I used to take pictures of back when I first started. This is 2014. So these are some of the implants that were placed by other doctors in the practice. And you could see the pictures are just like blurry. There's no, like it's a cast, there's nothing to it. But it was to me, out of all the thousands of thousands of photos I took back at the year of 14, these to me, I just picked them just randomly, just to give you a sense of why or when did I start taking pictures. Um, these are again, some of the older cases that, but it's funny, the, um, the other thing you could do on your phone, you could look back on your iPhone and go to year 2014. I don't know if you guys know that, but I, I regularly do this to go back and see the year, see the date and, and then find out what patients I saw that day in the schedule and super quick way of knowing who's that case that is. There's no name, of course. But again, you will see my iPhone back in 2014, this video, and I'm communicating with my lab guy of what the hell am I gonna do in this case? Kind of like, it's um, it's too much going on in there. But anyway, as far as giving you the sense of a little backstory about me and the, and the, and the, where the photography started for me, this is a little bit. And then I'll show you evolution of my photo, photo, photo studio. So 2017, I told you I opened my office um, and I had one of my operatory just to be a studio. And that was 2017, as you could see in here. Um, and then 2018, um, is where, this is my operatory. Um, in my operatory, I used to have, let me see, I don't know if you saw that. Yeah, it's a mounted boom with a soft uh, box that I brought over to the patient side. And this was before. Um, I got the flashes off the floor in here um, and then made my studio a little, uh, added the third uh, flash. Let me show you what it looks like now. So right now, this is, and I'm gonna give you a better overview, but in my operatory, I decided instead of uh, using this, let me put this again, instead of using this thing, um, the softbox, it was so heavy, gigantic, and it was so hard to work with. And it's not necessary for photos because I'm gonna share with you what I'm using now that is even almost better than that thing that I used to have. So right now on the right side, if you see, I put in two um, badass LED <laughs> strips. They're amazing because they make the room super bright, especially the patient's mouth where we take photos and stuff. So that's what it looks like, the operatory right now. Um, the uh, the photo studio, I changed it. Here's, um, here's a little going overview. I don't know how you guys see this, but it's more coming in, give you a quick tour. I took off the, those um, off the floor and I mounted them. I don't like things on the floor. It's so much easier when you have things mounted on the wall. Um, but again, you see two on the side, two on the one on the right, one on the left. And then I got one in the back, which this kind of pops their hair. Whenever they take a picture, you want to see, you don't want to have the patient space um, to be kind of be close to the, to the background. You want some sort of a layer. And that light in the back kind of creates that layer to make it more pop uh, that the hair start looking more 
um, nicer. I have some background stuff that if you do videos of the green screen stuff, um, and these mounted booms are awesome. Uh, by the way, everything that I'm going to share with you in this power uh, keynote is going to be listed at the website that I'm going to give. I created just this link for this um, uh, webinar. It's drperry.com slash HS, like Henry Schein. Um, thank you, uh, Adam. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> but that's what I created it's for you guys to be able to connect and, and get all these links. I also have this little tiny um, bar. A photo box. I, I don't know what you call it, um, but what you do, you can also get these from Amazon. So 20 bucks, you could do 20, 30, 40 bucks. You could put casts and, and different stuff in there. I have a mirror there that would kind of reflect some of these stuff, but just, I, di I did want to share a little bit about what, what is going on in my office. So you could kind of see and get a uh, sense of I also do face hunter in here. I would do a scan patients' faces with using that face hunter workflow. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about that here in a second. But that's pretty much it. Let me get into, now photography uses, you could use this for a front. I mean, this is a lecture, this is a slide. It's just going over what really can be done with having uh, photography, like all of those things and more. Um, in the front, you could do marketing, selling stuff, smile design, make your website pretty with all this pictures of patients. And you don't necessarily have to put before and after, just put emotions, just show patients that they come in and you're, you're a personable, you, your team is cool. Just take pictures and share them on your website. Um, and again, getting into the habit of photography, those things click with you more and you'll be able to implement those stuff to your website. The more and more you get right these days, like dentists, we have to be so much more connected to the people because that's how we need to be. And photography kind of the beginning of that path. Um, the same thing. So like, for example, this is Karen. That photo, we took a bunch of pictures and you can kind of give you an idea. So for treatment planning, for example, we're looking at the profile, see what kind of class, uh, what teeth are we going to set up for her. For lab communication, this is a portrait picture. Then we have a smile design, um, then marketing stuff in the Instagram. Then uh, you have all of these. So you can kind of get a sense of what we could use these photos for. Um, quick um, uh, notice or alert about last uh, lecture. I went over uh, with Henry Schein again. We, we went, uh, I did a big overview of analog and digital workflow, which is starts for one case. I went over the, the whole thing analog. Let me play it and see if it does. Oh, let me go back actually. Never mind. I thought this was going to play, but this, uh, we've been over this whole case. Um, and the reason I'm putting this right now here is for you to have a little bit of, if you want to learn more about some of these, um, like the analog workflow and my digital workflow, because that capture that you see is what we're going to cover today. So it's really important for you to know where I come from. And I think that lecture kind of proves the point of where my philosophy and, and, and how I'm moving things more and more towards digital. But in that lecture, I wanted to prove uh, all those steps that could be done in analog because I used to do that every day. And now I'm switching to more digital. So the first phase of that whole webinar that we went over was capture. Um, now we're going to talk about that. So in the series of now spoiler alert, uh, I'm going to have six webinars with Henry Shines this year. And then we're going to cover lots of cool stuff. Um, from starting with this lecture with photography and smile design. So check out that last one. It's on Henry Shine Dental YouTube. It's also on my website. I think there's a link there. Um, but definitely it's a good webinar to learn where I uh, see things in my philosophy of looking at full mouth dentistry. Okay, now the equipment. We talked about the why. Let's get into the equipment. And this is where it gets fun because there are only four components of a good dental photography. Um, there's a camera body, you got lens, you have flash, and then you have accessories. That's it. You got four things. It's very simple. Now we're going to cover those in a very quick, nice way for you to kind of get understand everything about these things in such a cool webinar in such a short time. <laughs> so the camera body, you have Nikon, you have Canon. Let's talk about the three common questions that people ask when they're looking to buy a camera. And those are these three things. Number one, DSLR versus mirrorless. 
the DSLR have been around for gosh, hundreds of years and they're not going anywhere. However, with the technology and how everything is moving fast, mirrorless cameras have come a long way. So I did want to mention the fact that there are a ton of people that are still interested in getting mirrorless. I honestly don't see mirrorless is still 2021 to be in the same level equivalent as DSLR because DSLR has more opportunity. There's more stuff that you could do. Mirrorless is getting better and better as we speak, meaning in five years, maybe I move myself to mirrorless stuff. But right now, I still feel and done tons of research is DSLR is where it's at. Um, and I'm going to give you the really the background be behind the differences in between each. As you can see with the DSLR, this is a DSLR. You're going to have the light rays that are shining through the lens and it goes through and you can see it hits the mirror and that mirror reflects the light and goes on into this prism. And then here's the viewfinder. That's where you're going to able to see where the photo is. So it's not direct. And you could see how, um, let me... Pause this. Not that one. Let's see. So it's got it's just bigger. You have a battery and it's got autofocus feature. The mirrorless ones is kind of like this. It you have the lens and then you have the light again, the same exact thing that was light rays come in. Then you have a sensor. So you have a direct sensor and then the optical center is right there. So you can see your image right away very quickly. It's got a shorter battery life. There's no mirror, so it's less camera shake. But honestly, the camera shake with all kinds of these lenses that are making with vibration reduction, it's so much easier to do um, DSLR still do good. Um, with the mirrorless, again, my opinion, I still stick with uh, DSLR any day. Um, before I move to mirrorless. Maybe for mirrorless, you could do video stuff for them. But as far as uh, when it comes to the comparison, to me, DSLR is where it's at. The second question is where um, full frame versus crop sensor. So the body of the camera could be full frame or it could be a crop sensor. Now let's talk about the differences between the each. The full frame, if you look at the photo on the left, you see how when it captures the uh, um, the cast or the teeth on the on the on that tray, you see the differences. On the left, you have the full frame Nikon D810, and then on the right, you have Nikon D7100. This Nikon D7100 is not a full frame; it's a crop sensor. So as you can see, the image is kind of cut, so you cannot see the whole thing. It's not full and you don't have the full field of view. And there's advantages to both. You can't say, oh, one is superior than the other. Now, of course, I love full frame because it gives me more um, uh, advantage. For example, I have the full picture of the teeth, but say what, if I wanted to take that full frame um, and, and move it and take it to um, uh, different places, I'm not able to have a range. I could make uh, my, if I had a better like lens, I could be able to, make things go in and out. But with the crop sensor, it's more narrower field of view. So there are more adva there are advantages and disadvantages. Here's the difference between a crop sensor, the same picture that was taken, the same, um, it's the same lens, same tripod, same setting, same distance from the object. It's just a different camera body. And you could see with the full field, you, you are able to capture more. And with the crop sensor, it just crops it. And uh, with the Nikons, they crop by 1.5. With a Sony, is one or uh, with the Canon, is 1.6. Uh, so it's narrower field of view. Again, the lens is the same, same everything. It's just the body of the camera that changed. Now, again, the second question you asked me: Do I like full frame versus crop sensor? I still prefer full frame for sure. Now, next is, of course, the, 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 the competition between Nikon and Canon. And that you can be honestly on Google searching this and you could see so many articles and videos of one saying one is better than the other. And I think it's just really the difference is like Microsoft and Apple, uh, Windows and Apples. Uh, so it's the same thing for me. With whatever you feel comfortable. When I did so much research uh, making these, especially with the Nikon versus Canon um, videos, Every video I watched that was Nikon 
was um, they, they pretty much said they're all very, very similar at the price range and everything. It's just where you really want to be. For us dentists, really, if you want, if you have Nikon already, and I love for you guys, if you have a, uh, I did, I was curious to know if you guys are watching, I want to know what is your camera? If you're using camera, put in either Nikon or the Canon on the chat box. And if you're not having anything, just put none. I just want to know, and, and, uh, and Adam can share this with me later after I get the answers. I just want to know how many people have cameras already existing. Now you can see on the left, you got Nikon. These are some of the more popular ones, the D7100. This, the D7500, I love the D810. I also love to get another one that would be D850. Um, it's just expensive. So I'm just sticking to my D810, it's working just fine. The Canon has the Rival series. They also has the Mark IV and Mark II. Um, I don't know much about Canon. All I know is that based on the videos I watched, Lots of people were talking about Canon videos are so much better. Uh, not so much, but again, the relatively speaking. Um, and then Nikon photos was good. So to be honest, I think for what we're doing, both would be fine. And, um, and that's another um, topic for another day. Now, the second component of good dental photography is the lens. So we talked about camera body. And now we talk about the lens. The body, again, full frame is cool. Then you need the DSLR, honestly, mirrorless stuff is not, I don't like them right now. I feel like I haven't really played with them as much, but at the same time, based on doing so much research, the DSLR work so much better uh, still, and mirrorless is not there yet. When it comes to a lens, um, it's, uh, it's very confusing. <laughs> I feel like the lens types, it is so very confusing because you got so many different genres and so many different classes and classifications. So I'm gonna make it super simple here. The lens there, as I said, there are like hundreds of lenses out there. So you gotta know, no one lens is gonna solve all your problem. But for me, one lens that have solved all the problem is the macro lens. Uh, and I'll talk about why is that. But when it comes to lens, um, and I don't want this lecture to just be dental photography, cause I do want to make it, if you start getting a camera, why not even use that camera at home or when you go out and start taking pictures um, and start getting familiar with the settings and it's cool stuff um, of landscaping, architectural stuff and a lot of stuff. But so when it comes to that, you got to know what are you shooting for? Like, what is, 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 is it going to be like photos? Is it videos? What exactly are you shooting for? So then you think about the lens type. Then where are you shooting these? Um, so that's again, low light is a tight space. Do you need a lot of room? Are you moving around? So before you get your lens, make sure what is the purpose of it? And also, of course, what's your budget? Because expenses, I mean, they can get very expensive. Some of them three, four grand. And then some of them, again, 50, 60, 100 bucks. So you just got to see what you need. And that's important for dental photography and close ups. I love my macro lenses because they do everything. Now, another classification of lenses are. Is it a zoom lens or is it a prime? And that is what um, to be, um, for me, I like the prime because it's fixed focal length. It helps me for, for dental photography. Um, and it, it, it works pretty well for me because I don't have to really take my camera outside of the office. I If I wanna go out, then I'll use a zoom lens instead of a prime lens, because if I'm out, I like to be able to have range of focal length. As you could see on the top, you see the fish eye. So like, for example, this video of the lens, you could see the different lenses, what kind of effect is making. Like you can see, uh, fish eye whenever the lens the focal length is super uh, small and then as you go up the depth of the background becomes closer so it's it's so much more um it, it, it's so much detailed when you have a close up and that's why i like this a macro lens now let's get into the ideal lens option for dental for focal length and f-stops um this is my preferred lens. This is what I, I would say, if you guys wanna invest into something, definitely get a prime lens that is fixed focal length. 
and then uh, 105 millimeter range is what I have, and the aperture is f 2.8, um, and it said that if the if the aperture is that low, um, or the f stop is that low, that means it's a fast lens, and fast lens is great because you can take very very quick shots. If the f stop is four or five, that means it's um, it is not as fast, so it's not going to be as clear image and crisp. So I'll talk about the aperture here in a second, but this is just a slide to give you a little about if you're looking for a camera, this is, uh, or lens, this is, uh, these are the three um, criteria that I would say um, are important. Now, once we've gone, covered the lens, the flash is uh, very important too, because it's all about the lights. Um, now with the lights, what type of flash should you invest in? There are off-camera flashes that you saw in my operator and uh, in my uh, studio. In one of the operators, actually, I built it like a studio, but uh, it, it's great for portraits because I could pay, I could put patients in there, and I could use my macro lens and go in and out. Um, but you need, if you have an off-camera flash, you're definitely going to need some sort of a space um, to be able to play some. Um, the on-camera flash is great for intraoral and extraoral. So I'm going to show you both of those options, what I use for my uh, extraoral and, uh, or I'm sorry, what I use for off-camera flash and what I use for on-camera. For the off-camera flash suggestions, you could see you have um, on the left, you have, this is a good setting. I honestly think on the right, this is a little too expensive. You don't need all of this. But at the same time, you do need to get some good lighting in your, in your system. The strobe lights is great for photography and the continuous light is great for videography. Um, you could do both, either one of these. Whenever you get um, those, you can turn on and the light and that would be continuous. And you could sync it to your camera and then whenever you take pictures, they will sync in. So, uh, these are the off-camera flash suggestions. Again, these are going to be more links is in my um, uh, website, drperry.com slash HS. I think at the end, I have that link up for you guys. So you can click on and see all kinds of different links and suggestions. The on-camera flash suggestions that I have are these. I used to have all of, I have all of these now, except this one, because I don't have a Canon, but in, in the past, where I used these ring flash, I hated it because the can the pictures didn't really come out that good. It it almost like it made that everything, all the teeth more opaque. And I didn't like it because there's too much light and, and it was just not coming from all angles. I, I don't like that one and I don't like this one. And I love my this is the one I use right now, and it's great because it's the R1C1 kit. And it's a speed light. You could manage these. And I also have soft boxes that are connected to these. And it's, uh, oh, shoot, it's here. <laughs> Thank you, Shane. <laughs> yeah, actually. So this is what it looks like. Um, if you put the soft boxes in front of it, and then you got this. Um, and I'm going to show you a little bit, I think. But it, it gives you the idea. So I could kind of rotate these, right? I go in and out. If I have too much light inside the mouth, I just bring them out like that. And then if you have not enough, then we can switch this around. There's a lot of things and I love this one and I do suggest it. Um, I think there's a slide there. I'll show what I have too. So you can see and take a picture. Okay. Now, once we covered the flash, we need to talk about the accessories, which is my favorite. My personal favorite is accessories because there's so many goodies you can get. Um, let's see. So mounted boom for off-camera flash, that's accessory. Then you got background, uh, rollers and fabric. You could do, uh, you could use those stuff. And you saw my um, my studio, I had different ones, which I honestly don't use them as much because the black works just fine. So you don't need all that. But again, if you're looking for doing some green screen, some videos then get a green one and the gray and white and all the colors. <laughs> so the mini soft box is what I showed you on my camera. And then the, of course, the, what we use every single day are retractors and contrasters. So I'm gonna go over quickly. I think I did it. Let me show you the video of this with this. Yeah. Okay. So now so you can like see. That we I start from, from two days the ago. left. We have a little um, basic kit, just a, basic a couple of in case if you need it. 
so there's but overall, mirror, you need the mirror. This mirror, um, I, they're the always scratched gate. up. I don't Cheap know. Cheap retractors that come in different honestly. formats. There's this I mean, one that has a, a longer up, tip. So this one has a shorter tip, but you can see each part. Like some do. small mouth, small. But also, yeah, like this one, this one, like this one, this one is great. There's also the metal one. This one opens up most than all this of these. So like the patients that are a little bit older, they have a lot of cheeks and lips. I like to use these because it takes everything off. And then in very certain, very rare cases, and now I use, um, I used to use these a lot more, but after the, um, I found out about Gate, I've been using this a whole lot more than the implant retractor. You could get the implant retractor. Let me see. I didn't. I was talking, and I'm not sure if you guys realize. So, the here's a contrastor. This contrastor is um, moldable, so you can kind of place it. It's flexible. You can put it in, and, and it's very cool because you can use that. Um, then you got the mirror. You got these retractors. There's so many retractors. But honestly, lately I've been uh, a super fan of um, Optra Gates. They become so easy and I'll show you how we use them. Um, but again, the other retractor is Start one of my from favorite ones. That that couple mirrors see. And cheek that has a see, this one is uh, not longer. It's, got, it's hard this for one patients. Shorter tip, as you can see each part, one. like some small mouth. Like this, this one is great. This is my, this is the better one. Is one. Great. That, like like some small mouth, you use a small, but I also like this one. This this one is good too because it has one handle so this is easier for them to hold this one is great there's also the metal one this one opens up most than all of these so the patients that are a little bit older they have a lot of cheeks and lips i like to use these because it takes everything off and then in very certain very rare cases now i use um i used to use these a lot more but after the um i found out about Optra gate i've been using this a whole lot more so I'm going to go over that. I'm going to have a video here in a second that we're going to show how I'm using this. So you can see all the pictures that I take and what, which angle and how I position myself. This is my setup. Um, the equipment, so you can see the flash cover, the camera body is Nikon D810, the soft boxes, and this is my everyday use pretty much. Um, the B and H, I don't know for you guys, but B and H customer service is extremely helpful. Uh, when it comes to answering questions, when you're not sure about a product, so what I did in one of my things in the lab, I took a picture and a video and I sent it to the guy I was talking on the phone. I'm like, hey, can I email you what it looks like? So then you can guide me through what light I need. And then the guy went on like 30, 45 minutes conversation and he showed me and he taught me a lot of things. And then I'm like, man, I love BNA. So I buy a lot of things from them uh, when it comes to photography stuff. And they're very reasonably priced. Well, now this is for folks that don't, want to invest in a camera i wanted to mention there are there's still hope there's still hope for you because uh, there are iphones now that have 45 cameras but there's so many things you could use and i showed you back in 2014 i was doing iphone and i was just working fine so don't think that you need to invest in a dslr i do think that if you really want to be a good dentist down i mean have a great opportunity to not just be good but also look at your work because part of what we say and i didn't really discuss is that the pictures tell stories and i me looking back at my dropbox and seeing thousands of cases and looking back and i'm like man look at these like oh, thank god nobody's seen this before so i think it's a great way of for you to get motivated to see where you are in 2021 and where you want to be in 2026 five years down the road but again camera works fine the iphone and i think there's a, something called the smile line i honestly don't know much about it i do know there are softwares and apps that connect to your phone to where you can put take a picture of the patient and it goes right into their open dental or dentrix or one of those i haven't done this myself because the way we do it we try to do dslr uh, pictures you know, with our dslr so i don't use the iphone for this i use the iphone for videos mostly but again, uh, there are, if you want to be super HIPAA compliant and make sure that you take the picture with the iPhone, then make sure you take that and, and be able to connect it to your um, dental uh, management software. 
Now, the settings. So let's see, about 35 minutes by, and we talked about the why. So I think by now you should know why we worried about all of these photography stuff. Why are we taking them? Then you talk, I talked about the equipment, then the settings. The settings are very important because honestly, if you're taking pictures and if you haven't started, it, it can get very confusing and boring. And so I thought to make this easier, we have three things. All you have to really know are three things. And that is aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. The aperture is the most, uh, one of the most influential parameters of camera settings because it's like, it plays a major role in the composition and the setting of a shot. Any picture you take in that shot, it's almost dictated by this aperture. Um, and, I'll, and I wanna make that aperture easy for you to understand. So I have a little clip coming up and I'm gonna explain those in detail. So make it easy for you to grasp. Aperture is a big, so if I had to, if I had a triangle and the most important one is like picking um, a camera setting and there are three things that are dictating it uh, to make a picture come out right as far as exposure goes, um, is aperture is number one and that we need to know. Then the shutter is speed and then the ISO. With the shutter speed, it's more about the, the length of the time when the image sensor in the camera is um, exposed to light. And I'll share another video to show. So the shutter speed is really the timing. Uh, the aperture is more depth of field and it's more like the eye of the, um, of the camera. And the ISO is more like sensitivity. So if you have an ISO of 100, it's super dark versus ISO of 6400, for example. And you see when it gets brighter, you're gonna get more noise and grain and it's not a good quality. So what do I like to make my ISO to be in a camera? Always 100 or below. That's where I like to have them because you do not wanna sacrifice a badass picture you took with it being more noisy and grainy. So let's talk about these three things. So, okay, you got it, right? The camera body, lens, flash, accessories, and now we're at the settings where we talk about aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. Let's talk about the aperture. Lens through which light travels into the camera body and onto the camera sensor. To understand, let's look at the human eye. All cameras are designed like human eyes. The cornea of our eye is similar to the front element of the lens, gathering light and bending it inward toward the iris. The iris can expand or shrink controlling the size of the pupil, which passes light into the inner eye. The pupil is what we refer to as the aperture in photography. The amount of light that falls onto the retina is determined by the size of the pupil. The larger the pupil, the more light falls onto the retina. The larger the aperture of the lens, the more light enters the camera. The iris of the lens controls the size of the aperture and is called the diaphragm. The diaphragm's function is to block all light with the exception of the light that goes through the aperture. So that is the most um, simplest way of explaining aperture. It's just a pupil in the eye. It just It's the same thing as opening up uh, the camera body in like the lens and you can see uh, light coming in. Now, how do they determine what's the numbering system for this? And it's so confusing. And here's how to make it a little bit simpler. F-stops are a way of describing how open or closed the aperture is. The smaller the F-stop means a larger aperture, while a larger F-stop means a smaller aperture. This can be tricky to remember since large F-stops mean small aperture sizes. So an F-stop of F1.4 is larger than f2.8 and much larger than f8 or f11. Aside from controlling the amount of light passing through the lens and into the camera, the aperture has a direct impact on the depth of field, the area of the image that appears sharp. So you could see the aperture is also responsible for the depth of focus. So it's not necessarily just the light coming in, but also it has uh, this second thing that is the depth of focus. And what that means is if you look at this camera, uh, this, this picture that it shows, how blurry is this background? And then it's gonna explain to you what's the difference between having high F stops, you have more range, or you want low F stops. So listen to this part. Light passing through the lens and into the camera 
the aperture has a direct impact on the depth of field, the area of the image that appears sharp. A large F number such as F16 will bring all foreground and background objects into focus, while a small F number such as F1.4 will isolate either the foreground or background objects and make everything else blurry. Every so that's important because how would that affect my teeth? If I took a picture of number eight and nine, the, the front teeth, uh, the centrals, and then the background or the uh, number, the bicuspids and the molars are blurry, then that means automatically my F stops, the range that I am taking that picture is not in range. So then I need to increase my F stop. And that's why I'm going to get into where a little detail in terms of what you need to do and what are your apertures need to be um, set as. This is a shutter speed. So the shutter speed, again, the, there's three things, aperture, which is the most important part. And then you have shutter speed, which is this. And the shutter speed is really the timing for this, the, 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 for the lens to be opened. Uh, the image sensor to be exposed. So this is a cool video, uh, the animation that shows what's happening. Instead of the viewfinder, once the mirror is flipped upwards, a small door will move from top to bottom, exposing the sensor beneath. After that, another door will fall down, covering up the entire sensor. After the second door closes, your mirror will fall back into place. The doors will then reset to their original positions underneath. The longer the shutter is kept open, the more light will enter the camera. You know. So that you heard that the longer the shutter is open, so you have a long shutter speed, then you're going to have tons of light coming in. So that is why it's so important to understand the shutter speed. For example, if you have this picture on the right, it's and they, how do they how do they um, measure them? How do they represent? It's all about a fraction of a second. So if you have a fast shutter speed, it's like in sports. When you want to freeze that action or like a motion of somebody's running or or um, a splash of water, then you want to high, very super high shutter speed, like one over thousands of a second. But if you want um, like a long shutter speed, if you want it slow, then it's more about like if you want to capture something it's like a special occasion, it's going to be like thirty seconds. Right, like things are gonna go for such a such a span of time, so it's more occasional, different things. But um, for normal photography, honestly, there's only two different shutter speed that I change my stuff at, and that's usually one over uh, two hundred and fifty. Or um, and I have those measurements here in a second. But with shutter speed, you don't have to worry of changing it as much. This is the exposure triangle. And it's so powerful because it tells you everything we talked about in this nice little summary. <laughs> so you have the shutter speed and then you got ISO and then you have aperture. So you could see if you have the F2.8, that is the wider opening like that eye. Remember the F2.8, that means the thing is so open that the eye is seen, so that all the lights coming in. And then when it's narrow opening, it's less light coming in. So if you want more focus, so if having this little cheat sheet, it helps you understand where you need to be. Um, with the ISO, again, I like to keep things simple. ISO is always 100 or even 60 sometimes, but always, I usually try to keep it 100. Shutter speed, it changes with one over 160. Um, that is most of the time, but one over two, uh, 250 of the second. And the f-stops, it all depends because f-stops can go high as 36 or as low as 2.8 with um, photos that I'm going to show you later. I'm going to talk about this. So I shared with you like now a little bit about um, the settings, but it's all confusing until you actually see uh, some examples of real cases and examples of pictures that I've taken to share with you. Now, here is where I introduce you to my photo templates. And it's so funny because I um, some people have asked me in the past to give them on Instagram or messages like, hey, dude, you have a, uh, a template of photography, like a presentation that you show patients of um, their, uh, like, how do you present stuff? And, and anyway, it was in the back of my mind that I always needed to create something that's so like special. And then me and Shane, my uh, manager, he helps me with all of this stuff. We sat down and we're like, how do we make this simplified? How do we simplify this? And I thought of 
567 PCI is the greatest thing I could come up with. <laughs> right so you stick with me. I'm going to make this very simple. So 567, this is how photo templates would work. Now let's talk about that. What, that, what does that mean? What is 567 PCI? So five is the number of photos. So five portraits. This is my lovely um, front desk, Hayward. <laughs> For all you single doctors, skip these next few lecture, a uh, few uh, slides because she's taken, she has a boyfriend, <laughs> but she was so gracious and very um, uh, kind to allow me to take pictures of her to be able to share with you guys. But look, you got five portrait photos. You get that big smile. I always tell the patients, try and show me your gums. Like, give me that Duchenne smile. Give me that, that smile. I want to see your gum because nine out of 10 patients, when they come in, they haven't smiled in years. So you, good luck trying to get them to show you gums or give you anything. So you got to make them. And, and that is so important because it can get your ass in trouble <laughs> later if you do a full mouth and then you see their lip goes, whoa, like up. So... Um, ask me how I know, and that's again, going to take pictures is a big part. And that starts with five portraits. We have the frontal one, get that nice smile. Then I do a right 45 degrees. And then I do a left 45 degrees. But then when I do the right profile and the left profile, you always wanna make sure that you don't see the other side. And that is so important because it doesn't matter how old the patient is. It doesn't matter how uncomfortable the tight space is. Either don't take the photo, or if you are taking the photo, take it in a way that it's gonna be useful. So sometimes if you're not gonna get this right profile, it's gonna hurt because that is so important for the lab to see. So now I'm gonna share with you later here how we're gonna use that. But the five, six, seven works like, so five portraits, six is gonna be the close-ups. So again, five portraits, six close-ups. And how are those close-ups? It's very simple. It's the same exact thing you saw. I tell them to give me a big old smile. Then I zoom in. I go in closer to the patient. Because I have a lens that's 105, when I am back, um, I, I, I cannot like focus because it's not a, a zoom lens. It's a prime lens. So it's fixed. What that means is that I have to move myself, which is fine because I move very close to the patient and I snap a shot where with a big smile, then the same thing, right? 45 degree and then turn all the way. It's very helpful to get a, a chair that it, uh, it's got a spinner on it. So you can rec and, and get the patient to spin instead of having to get up and turn. So focus on that, get those photos. You have um, six close-ups. So the only thing that changed with the close-ups that we got closer is this picture, which is the Emma. And that Emma, I put that out there because it is important for a patient to say Emma and then hold the lip because I want to know at the resting, and the Emma, that's what that means. It's a resting position of the lips, is that how much tooth display, how much gum display, what's going on? And sometimes in the past, when I used to do digital uh, analog, I would go and measure uh, behind the canine because you want the canine to be zero, if you've done the COIS um, uh, uh, protocol. So you go measure how many millimeters are behind the, behind the lips and that helps. Now with the photography and the video, it's gonna, it's gonna be easier because now you can scan things and see them. Now we talked five, six, seven PCI, we didn't cover the seven. The seven is gonna be the fun stuff, which is the intraorals. The intraorals are awesome because that's when you actually become intimate. <laughs> that's when you get to know your patients. That's when you see everything. And um, same thing, if you really think about it, that's how I was able to make this simple because 567 PCI, um, the frontal bite, then you have the right 45 degrees. Take a, take a look at this. You see how I used the Optra gate and it didn't give me that gum that I wanted to see. That's one of the downfalls of uh, the frontal, the, uh, the using the Optra gate for photography. Later, I'm going to show you a video of how I use the other retractors. That's more, you see how much I can see better. The right buckle and left buckle are honestly so hard and difficult to get. And sometimes you could replace these with your scan. If you have an intraoral scanner, you can always have a right side of their scan when they bite down and then the left side. And of course, the last two are the maxillary occlusals and the mandibular occlusal that you could see the surface of them um, 
But then again, if you have a hard time, patients cannot open, then you might as well go ahead and scan them with the intraoral. But this is this is my way of making it easy. Five, six, seven, PCI, and it's easy to remember. You could always have that in your workflow. Take the pictures just as it is, and then um, get in the habit of and um, just doing the same thing over and over and over and over. Now, here's a practical application because I told you, I promise I'm going to show you how you we turn the this. camera on. So let's take a using, second. It's giving this. me an F22 160. That's pretty good. I turn the flash on and let's just go ahead and see how we can take it. So just a little background. I just picked the camera and I saw it said F22, whatever it was. And I'm going to take a picture because I want you to kind of know a little bit of background to what, how, how we, how did we start and what I'm going to do to fix it. Okay, I'm going to bring the patient back all the way. I think that's how we. Perfect. So what you're going to do, you're going to have your patient open. You're going to insert one hand. With the other, you're gonna pinch your obturgate, place it in, and then you're gonna work on the bottom lip and then on the top. Wow, yeah. <laughs> look at that. Little uh, background story. Oh, shoot. Um, Christine, my, um, what? Let me go back. Christine, we call her a master obturgator because she is so good at being able to place this. Retry obturgate so the camera fast on. in patients yeah. mouth, me, in the middle giving... of surgery that none of and everybody's like Christine, come on, because she gets it just like this. Let's take it and pay attention to see how she does it. You're gonna insert one hand with the other. You're gonna pinch your obturgate, place it in, and then you're gonna work on the bottom lip and then on the top. Wow, look at that. Wonderful. I go ahead and bite down. So as you can see, without any help, she's closed, and I can kind of capture. See how easy it is to see everything. The, but then again, when you take the picture, you cannot see all the gum. Here's my position. So let me go back. This is what it. She's closed, and I can kind of capture. See how easy it is behind the patient. See, and I'm pointing down like that. That's how I like to position myself when I take these intraoral ones. So this is what it shows. So you can see take my ISO. How ISO is 160, which is fine. I'm going to actually turn that down even more to like 100. I'm going to open up the F22. I'm going to go up to 36 and just get another shot just to see how much of this light and I'm putting, pointing my um, pointer between the eight and nine. So you could see now, very quickly. I'm going to do that to on the right the side. Two, it's kind of like 45 degrees. 36 because we wanted less light. Another thing I could do, another thing I could do when it was so light out there, another thing I could do is to turn the lights down or turn my flash down and keep my f-stop. If I really love, I was in love with that f-stop, then I'll keep that f-stop. But normally I like to change the aperture always. Remember, I said aperture is the most important part. Change that. Um, and of course, whenever you also increase your f-stop, meaning going from f22 to f36, what is going to happen? I'm going to open up my range of uh, field, meaning I'm going to get more focused stuff. So it's not just going to be one teeth, a set of teeth. You're going to get all the teeth in the back. So I love uh, higher F stops, always better, as long as the light looks good. This is where I do the 45 degrees, where and my I, this is what it gave me. Yeah. Now with the Optra Gate, it doesn't show you the gingival as much as you want. So sometimes I take the optra gate out and reinsert my cheek retractors. Whenever you want to insert these, you want to make sure they're wet. So sometimes you want to wet them. Or a little bit of water. You can do some water and open it. As you can see, it goes in. And then you can have the patient hold it or you could hold it. Now let's try the other end and see if the other end is too big or how is okay. that? Just to see. And then bigger end on that one. Okay. It just kind of gives you the differences. Close. 
So now you I see can't how really much retract. Yeah, that's good. But you see how much more you could see. Forty-five degree, and then the last one. Other side corner you saw. The same side. Mm -hmm. If I can get it from here, it'd be nice. So it's the nice same thing. I come that. over. Sometimes I come. I'm, I'm in the. Um, you just have to see how you're gonna get that occlusal plane. You want to be perpendicular to the occlusal plane. This is what plane we could get all the way the back. The buckle so shots are hard. Using so that's the why middle retractor on one end, and then the mirror on the other. Go ahead and bite down. And that is what I can capture. Now, if we capture it from her view, on this end, so Again, the F30, so, so I'm not going to look at the relationship like by, It's the same thing as the last one. So that's why good. so many people are like, man, side. I'm so confused about these F-stops. It's not much. The ISO doesn't change. The shutter speed is most of the time the same. All you're doing is changing your F-stop. So you don't need to let the computer to be auto. Why the, what the, what's the point of auto when you can just quickly have a manual yeah, and see, be able to don't manipulate. use the retractor on the right side, how darker it looks. To be able to get a good image. Back. Yeah. Yeah, it's just it's time to use it like this. Yeah. I think we're gonna have to pull that hard. Let me see what else. Oh, so for the occlusal, this is what I use. Okay, thing. I use that mirror. It's called Osong mirror. They're amazing. Perfect. Again, they just get scratched all the time. Big, 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 big. Um, and they're not cheap either, but you definitely need a few of those. Um, so one shot, you were able to capture. So you can see, you want to get the tuberosity if you can, or thick back thick here. More or something more, but that's enough. Um, Over there. Can, again, if you don't like to do these, um, stick to your intraoral scanner. You could always use that to have a screenshot of your uh, scanner. For the, if you notice for the maxillary occlusal, I have to stand behind the patient. But for mandibular occlusal, it's almost, it's hard to do it behind the patient, do it direct. So I use the mirror again. I tell the patient, I instruct the patient Put the tip of your tongue towards the back of your mouth. You can't get the, these. The, the you can always area. get your intraoral and then you push scanner the to capture the um, occlusal shots. So you kind of guide their tongue to go back and you tell them. And then sometimes you can also right ask your patient to hold you with like you help you hold. Tongue, so if you the would bring their hand and then hold it and guide them through. And then that again, a contraster is pretty cool hand. because you can mold it wherever, and, and so that gives example, a good I nice didn't have um, this thing right here, right now. Background. What Super would I cool. do in order to get the same shots? I'll just have the patient like that. Again, same style, everything the same. Um, left side. Now, once we covered the practical application, we have some tips. I have some uh, the um, tips of photography, and then we're gonna talk about smile design. The photo storage is a big deal. You want to, these are some of the tips that honestly is so, so powerful. One is get a computer, or if you need to buy a new computer and just assign that computer to be your photo computer. That computer is almost like a media for your office. It costs, I don't know, a new computer, how much, but you need to assign a computer and then get an external SSD because you don't even need to have it on camera um, or on the computer, but have the SSD to be um, used for just specifically for um, uh, photos. That is very important because you want to keep a track and organize your folders based on the SSD, name of the patients. And the last but not least is I think is so important is get with your IT people and select, a, create a shared folder on the network of all your computers. Because for example, when I take a picture 
or when I do a scan, intraoral scan, I like to save that SDL in the computer, but then I want to access that SDL from all the computers in the office. So we have a shared folder in the net, on the network that my lab can connect with my patient that could see all my scan data, my line data, my, my intraoral scans and my photos of the, all of these are saved. So no more going from a bunch of different companies. This is honestly have helped me so much, not me, but all my team members to be able to communicate and be able to keep track of the stuff. Um, now shooting raw format, always you want to shoot in raw because you can manipulate your almost, if you have, sometimes the exposure is low, you want to bring the exposure up. You could do that. Um, a raw format is always going to allow you to do this So make sure every photo you take is always raw. Or in my case, I always like to do raw plus JPEG because JPEG is going to show me quickly. The raw is going to take, um, it has to go through this process to be able to um, be produced as a JPEG um, because it cannot be read. But ultimately, you always want to shoot in RAW. Now, with some of the softwares you need to know, these, um, honestly, they're hard. They're not easy, but Lightroom and Photoshop. They're $9.99 a month. Uh, it's 120 bucks a year, and that is going to be able to organize your photos. That is how... Um, you could use them. We, of course, we have these. That's what we use. I'm not saying you need this because, again, the whole learning curve of being able to take pictures is one thing. And trying to tell you to do Lightroom and Photoshop on top of it makes you not want to even do this. So that's why if you are already taking pictures and you want to get organized, hello, this is a great slide. But if you have not even started taking pictures, so just kind of see where your learning curve is and make sure whatever you set tone is really a, re a real a goal, not just a shooting for something that is never going to happen. The Some of the apps to make your life easier. This app, <laughs> I made this, uh, we made this a few, gosh, I don't know, I think it's a couple months now, but ever since we made that slide thing, everybody's, uh, so many hundreds of people ask me about this app. What do I use? It's called Photo Compare. The um, other apps that I love to use are Quick. I use that for making quick videos. So say, for example, I have a case. And so every segment of the case, I take a bunch of videos, like for example, 10 seconds um, here, 10 seconds there. And then you go to Quick. Quick makes it super professional, so easy, so fast and quick. Um, Cut Stories, where I use to add some logos. Um, the other one is Maldiv. I use that to get creative with the photos. I used to use it a lot more, but honestly, there's not need to. Uh, with Quick, I make videos, cut stories, stuff for Instagram, but um, you can also cut things and add music. But uh, with uh, Maldiv, you can do photo stuff. So these are some of the apps that I like. Now, one hour passed, and now we get into talking about the smile design. Now, once you have, you've, you've taken the pictures, there's not too many slides left, so this is going to be the, the fun part. So if you're tired, you need to stick with me for another 30 minutes, and then we got questions. But hopefully, I'll finish before then. So smile design is... Um, it's, it, it has revolutionized the, the way we envision a treatment plan for patients. It's, it's got to a point where I, it was so fancy back in the day where, and I, and I love technology. I love to buy things that come out very quickly. I'm an early adopter, I feel like, and I did. Um, I started, man, I started doing the smile design early on, but it was so hard to implement and keep it because we did it for one patient. And then the second patient was like, oh, I don't want to. So ultimately I got too lazy. What used to be a picture can now really be a reality. And I'll tell you why smile design for me nowadays is so much faster and quicker and more predictable. And that's why one of the reasons I wanted to, I was so excited about this power uh, keynote was the smile design and how I make my full arch restorations come from fancy pictures to reality. They are constantly getting better as well. Let's talk about why are we doing a smile design? What are the points? One that is super important is uh, the most important part, I think, is the predictable prosthetic planning. You always want to know where the teeth need to go in the face, because if you don't know where the teeth are going to go in the face, you're always going to have a hard time and going back and forth, back and forth. So the first thing is taking pictures of your patients, PCI, remember, five, six, seven PCI, then bring the pictures into the smile design. 
and get to know what, okay, so if this patient was going to get new teeth, where am I going to put the eight and nine? And I'm going to talk a little bit about smile and show you some cases, but that is one thing clinically, right? So the clinically, it helps us to know the prosthetic planning. Getting to know our patient's expectations. This is a photo I think last week um, we took. And you can see the patient is showing and I'm looking at my smile design computer and I'm sharing with her because here's me asking her. I'm like, okay, what kind of teeth do you see? And then I'll show her face. I'm like, do you like this? Do you like that? And patients always give you some feedback that you want to hear because you want to hear that. Where did they come from? What are they looking at? Because it makes your life easier. And then another thing is also selling treatment, of course. I don't use it for selling treatments as much as I would love to because we don't have time. But ultimately, every patient that gets um, a full mouth definitely goes through a series of photos. I mean, any, every patient goes through pictures. But with the smile design, any patients that is full mouth or a cosmetic case, I always do a smile design. Always. Um, and that's really after a patient's paid. So it also it could be used for selling treatments and marketing, et cetera. Um, this is a smile design. Uh, some of the softwares, there's Plan Mecca and 3Shape that are sold by Henry Shine. Those are uh, very good. I love 3Shape because it's integrated with my 3Shape scanner. It's super powerful. Um, I'm gonna talk about the Smile Cloud today that I use right now. ExoCat, I have the software. They have a Smile Design. DSD's been around. They've been doing it. Medit has it, and Smile Designer Pro. When I started back in, I think when I when I saw that my journey with the Smile Design started in 2017, 16. When I first opened the office, I was like, man, I'm gonna do all this. I'm gonna have this studio. I'm gonna do Smile Design on my patients. But and I got the Smile Designer Pro. I did it, but honestly, it was so hard to implement it. When you first open the office, there's so many different things that goes on to it. So you're like, man, I can't be there. Somebody like, I, I just stopped. So I got lazy. Nowadays, 2021, smile designs have gone crazy out of control. There's so many things you could do with them. And that's what we're going to talk about. The face, the alignment, the crop, the lip contour, uh, all of these things can be can be automated, uh, automatized, um, automized. <laughs> so I'll show you. Now, some of these modern smile design features, you could do multi-sync. So if you have a patient, you're doing a crown length thinning, you could, again, look in there and be able to kind of design a future crowns and you could sync it with their face. So as you are changing their teeth, you could see their face changes. It's got adaptive lighting. You could get the teeth now in colors just so good that you can get the chroma just like how you want it. You could get the value exactly where, how high and dark you want them. And automated is where it's at. I mean, these days with Alexa's and Apple running the world, I think with the smile design, things need to definitely be autom automated. And um, and that's another, I guess that's the word. I said automized, there it is, automated. <laughs> Okay, so now that out of all of this, this is not really that important, all of this. What is important is this next slide, which is downloading the tooth library. Because with libraries, gosh, you have the world in your fingertips, everything. You could do things like, I mean, everything. You have the scan of the patient, you have a 3D x-ray, you have the photos clinically, and then you have a smile design. You got this, like there's, I mean, everything is done for you already. All you have to do is just to go and assemble things and puzzle and, and put things together. But ultimately, you should be able to now see 2021, so many things, and it's not fair because this is available and they're not that expensive. So the, the, th the cool thing about SmartFly that allows you to, it, it makes the um, artificial intelligence. So this is what I use. Uh, I'm not going to focus on which software really because you can get a similar result with most of these programs, um, different programs. But I will say that I use the uh, SmartCloud because it's just simple for me. It works and it's a monthly subscription. Um, I'm not getting paid by any anybody in terms of as far as the, the company is my glad I'm not getting the sponsor or anything, but I do use it. And I, as you've been to uh, see my stuff on Instagram, see my stories, I like to share things that I do daily. I'm not trying to um, say, oh, go do this because guess what? There are so many other softwares that just probably do this or better, but this is my workflow. So don't judge me in terms of like, this is his, his, um, his uh, bias. I just use this. Now, maybe next year I'll have something else that's better, but right now this works for me. 
Here's a case example that I will share with you. So the smile design has been done. We took two pictures and all you need for smile design is really two. So going back to your five, six, seven PCI, five portraits, six close-ups and seven intro orals. What you need is the portrait, one of the pictures and you want the maximum smile. Again, that's why I asked or uh, mentioned there that to have the maximum smile to show all the gums because that is the photo you wanna bring in to your a smile design. The other thing you want, and it's optional, is the intro oral. If the patient is gummy smile, you need to, uh, you don't need it, but if the, if you are, I mean, honestly, what I do is I always, we like to have two, the intro oral and the portrait. And that's all you need. From those photos that you taken in your SSD, you bring that into the software. And here's, this is what you could do there. The software, you click the, the, the patient and you could click on, again, their face. You could edit that, for example, if you wanted to make the brightness and you don't, I don't honestly do anything like that. All I go, I go to the design and I'll show you step-by-step step how to do this. Until so the new design, you pick the, you pick the portrait. So this is the portrait that you picked and it gets automated. It finds out where the eyes are. So you just kind of, and I usually go with this. I sometimes crop it, uh, but most of the times the facial references are there automated. The lip contour, it's almost automated, but you still have to kind of come in and I like to kind of make it better. If you don't want to do this part, you could always X out and do it yourself, like moving your mouse to, um, around a patient's mouth. And what you want to capture here is really the, inter, uh, the inner uh, corners of the, the mouth. And that's where you want to tell the computer that, hey, this is how much it's showing. So you have to fine tuning the restorative space. That is the next thing. After you got the lip contour, you wanna get how much is a restorative phase I have. And this is why I told you, it's so important to know what you're working with because, and I use these lines because on the right and the left, if you go in, you can drag the line and that line gives me the midline because I can know exactly, okay, that's the midline. Uh, you need to stop the adaptive lighting sometimes to make it more um, natural. But again, you could just play. So I usually click on one central and then see what centrals do I like and how do they work with? They usually, you could play with the papillas. You could see where you want to make the, uh, uh, the, the, this is the zenith line or the upper line. And then this line is the smile line. So you could again, see what is your preference. And this is not a lecture about what the teeth need to be, how they need to look like. That's a whole another um, ball game in terms of where they need to be, what color or what shape, um, what ethnicity, what what type of like age and, and their mouth and everything is so important to know. Um, but for the sake of this, it's like you have that power now that you'll be able to do this. If you look at um, the photos, once you do one design and you can kind of move things around just to make it a little different and you have the patient there or you could share this with the patient but ultimately, once you open this up, you could move things around. I'm just kind of playing around. This was a few days ago, and I was like, shoot, let's just do some of these just to show. So don't judge me based on what things look like. <laughs> this is more about, hey, how easy, quickly I can get this. And guess what? When I go to the design now, uh, in a few clicks, four or five clicks, three, four minutes, shouldn't take long, really. But then you can actually put this together. So you have that with um, comparison. So you're like, hey, Miss Karen, do you want the right thing? Do you think light one look better? Then send them these pictures through email. You know, like they could go home and look at these and like ask their friends, what do you think? It gives you some guidance. But then again, if you want to design some new ones, you could click on compare. But ultimately, the same thing over and over. You just kind of go in a few clicks um, and then next. So this is a case, actual case that I did. So let me show you how this looked like, right? So we did the surgery, we did a smile design and here's the next slide that shows you. So we went, this is a gift that we have. So this is the smile design and here's the final or the temporary that she's wearing the same day of surgery. So it's very powerful, it's very close. And I show you how you can uh, download the library and be able to do this either yourself in your office, in your lab, or tell your lab that this is what I want to do. Um, here's another example. If you're following the workflow from photography section again, the patient arrives for a consult and is taken to the photo area for pictures. 
after the pictures are taken, the portraits, you know, extra oral, the patient, uh, the, the photos can be sent through the smile design. You don't necessarily need to get all the intro oral. Um, you could just take a couple of pictures, send them back. You're like, hey, here's the smile. Do you like it? What do you think? And then if patients see it, maybe they, you never know. I'll have a video here soon to show you what a uh, patient did after we showed her the smile. Again, coming in the inner side of the ear, things are kind of automated for you. You have the crop, then you go to the draw of the lip, and I'm going to move forward to see. So here's the, again, the proportion, artificial intelligence. There are so many data that are given into this software where it shows if you want that calculation of 80% width to length ratio, for example, or 85, if you want a more squarish, or do you want a more tapered or 75%. So then based on the the tooth libraries that the software has, it gives you suggestion. It proposed to you that, hey, you want to use these teeth. And then that you can kind of go back and forth between the teeth and see what you like. Ultimately, it's just giving you the power of being able to do this. So here is, for example, Brian. If for any folks that is watching this, this is a patient where uh, we did a live um, all on X course on him and he was a patient of us. So we were just doing a small design now that we're getting the final for him. So we're, um, he's done, it looks amazing. But again, we're going in the left, on the left side, you can see there's a proposal. So if you do 72%, things are gonna change. So you see the yellows are the ones that the computer is saying, hey, these might match better. The white, maybe, and then the gray is not good. Um, so that is a little bit about um, how, what are the capabilities of these? You could, again, slide them in. Here's another thing that, um, let me see. Here's another case. Let me show you. This is a case that I'm going to show you surgery of it too. Um, Jason, I'm going to do a new design. And again, we put all these pictures on the right. You don't need them all. Just put a couple pictures there. Uh, the portrait for sure, because you cannot move forward without portrait. Just put the facial references. It's already determined for you. You pretty much, you can either change it or go next. You could um, do the smile, the, the lip contours. Let me move forward a little bit and see. For example, here are the teeth that is proposing, then we could switch the teeth again and then show them what do they want. Let me, um, I'm gonna make sure that I, so you can always in the middle go back and be able to um, place, I like to put these lines because it gives me that, like where does the, uh, um, where the eye pupils are and then where's the midline. And then sometimes you add that second line in here and that will give you the smile line, but the smile line is already there. So you don't really necessarily need that extra line. There are, again, this is the smile line. You could make their smile more, less, you could customize it. Um, you could do one tooth and then mirror it to the other one if you like. Um, it takes about half an hour really to be able to get this software pretty good. It doesn't really take much time, but, but you do need to, uh, again, I'm mirroring that side and then looking at it because these teeth that are there are natural teeth. These are based on natural dentition. So you always want to replicate the nature. And you could, if you have an intro oral, like if you're doing cases that are intro oral, you could always superimpose their uh, intro oral photo to the extra oral photo. So this is where I'm putting the two together. So these are going to merge where now when you see and make the changes to the teeth, you can kind of see it quickly in the patient's face. So as you can see, I'm moving this. You can see how it moved in the patient's face. If I'm bringing it down, it's going to come down. So it's very cool because you can see the underlying um, structures and see what's going on. Um, as my buddy, Dr. Sinata says, what's under the curtain? <laughs> so that's what you could see with this. With this view now, on the right, you could also look at and make uh, the, the value of the teeth more younger or more value. And, and the other way is more chroma. The right side is more chroma. You can make it more yellower or make it more whiter. And they're pretty, pretty good lighting um, in terms of the, the adaptive. And again, at the end, you compare them. Now, here's a case. So once we get that case, I'm going to go over the next step is showing you how 
that I designed this smile, what I'm gonna do next, okay? So here's the lab process. Lab gets these teeth that are here. And this is for peak, for folks that are peak users or you do full art, you understand what this is. This is a whole another lecture that I will cover the digital workflow uh, A to Z. But right now, I just wanna show you that library that you saw that green teeth, this is what I got from there. I'm gonna position it based on where I think the ideal eight and nine need to be. Now, I also have the face. I'm not showing this in here, but I also have the patient's face. So with everything that I have with the smile design, I, I showed, uh, I saw that picture. I like that picture. I like those teeth. I'm bringing them in. And then I'm having Tyler, my technician, to be able to mold the zircons on or the teeth that I'm getting from the software and mold them into place to make them like the library teeth. So if you look at C, the white is the teeth that the computer is saying, okay, you wanna make teeth for this patient that has 16 plants? And this is actually same day of surgery. That's how cool it is because you can do this ahead of time. And then whenever you introduce the implants, you could do the immediate load, which is amazing. But uh, that's another conversation. This is more about the library that you brought with the new teeth. The white is the proposed teeth. And then the green is where we got from the library, the STL files. So we are molding them exactly like how the library told us this needs to look because we like the library teeth. We like those pictures. Um, so that's why it's making it almost become a reality from seeing what we saw in the pictures from a picture of a portrait to the actual surgery and how predictable this could be based on being able to um, replicate this. Now, if you don't have a lab right now, you could always, always do these photo smile design and get the STL Send that STL to your lab. Be like, hey, this is the teeth that patient and I like, and we'd like that for you to replicate that. And it's very simple. If they know anything about labs and softwares, it's not hard. Exocats, zircons on, and, and so forth. It doesn't matter. It's a three shape. It's very doable because STL is a universal file that is, can be opened with anything. So now that we got this, we print it. We print it using our 3D printer. <laughs> This is what it looks like. And I'm gonna show you going into C, same thing. I'm going direct to the multi-unit. And this is what it looked like. This is the smile design that we liked. And this is where we ended up with the 3D printer. Yeah, it looks very nice. Very simple on there. Now you're gonna feel a little pressure, okay? Yeah, Keep it going in. Perfect. Just try to hang in there, honey. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Oh, big, big, big. Show me some. So once you screw them in, and I won't drag, you could see, and I'll show you before and after of how this smile design we predicted is so close to what we ended up. And that is hard. Yeah, you're talking a lot yeah. of elements that are new. Yeah. You got implants, you got bone reduction, you got the new prosthetic space. How are you going to put it that are going to look yeah. just like the pictures? It's going to be tough for you because you haven't had TV yeah. here yeah. for a while. It's a lot of moving parts. Gum, but ultimately, to make the gum look good. And these videos, if they're okay, live, big, 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 big. Yeah. I talked to Adam earlier. We're going to put this whenever they yeah, come nice. out. With the yeah. webinar, you could see yeah. the better kind video of series of gum. I'm going to share these perfect perfect videos with, with him great so job. that you can actually see them better. Outstanding the on the tissue, just good, enough good pressure good. where it's going to train the tissue, right, Christine? Mm -hmm. And it's very nice here. The bite be adjusted a little bit on this side, but not really. I'm going to bite down again. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Perfect. Oh. Perfect. Oh, big, big, big. Sure. Okay. So again, now going next, you can see the smile design, the predictability. Here's the, how the patient showed up. This is the smile design. And here's the same day smile. Pretty good. I mean, I would say again, there's a lot of moving parts, but just to give you a, a sense of this is not just one lucky patient or one lucky case. Every day we're doing this. This morning I did this. Good. I did a terrible Look case. At this those. is another nice. case. I just wanted to share. Right down. You. Here's Hat, G. Tap, tap. Perfect. It's looking good. Go back. 
here's a screenshot I'm just <laughs> like here. There's this smile, there's, uh, there's the pre-op portrait again, PCI, 567 PCI. Here's your portrait. Here's the smile design we like for him. And here's the teeth. Look at those, so nice, you pearly. Bite down, tap, tap, tap. Perfect. I don't know why. It's looking good. <laughs> smile. Yeah. Yes. That's why That's very it nice. is predictable. And I want to share with you one more slide, which is this that you saw at the beginning of uh, this webinar. Okay, big reveal. Oh, wow. Oh, my gosh, Courtney. So this is a patient that have gone through hell. Oh my God, this patient has gone through so much and she's, a, she's a, an activist in Nashville. And we decided to, every year, I give a smile um, uh, away um, for a deserving mother who's gone through so much and is also a community activist, somebody who's helping. And she's gone through so much and she has so many organizations for bringing peace to the people. And I decided to do a full mouth for her. Um, and this is where she's just seeing her face um, in the in the smile design that we did again as a daily thing we do, and I just want to kind of share with you what's what's the meaning of all of this. Oh my gosh, Courtney! Wow! Oh my gosh! That's how my you're beautiful now. <laughs> And again, clean me. Nobody deserves this more than you do. Thank you so much, Pam. We haven't done work on her there. She just showed me. Oh, Jesus. He still looks like me. Uh -huh. <laughs> he still looks like me. Uh -huh. I looked at so many pictures of myself, so many pictures of myself. Out of my 60 years, 60 years, this is the best picture that I've ever seen of myself since a picture I saw when I was 10 years old and I was in a, sc a school picture that I don't remember, but I was smiling and I had all my teeth, I was teeming. And I haven't had a mouthful of teeth since. And just to see this right here, this, this look like me, it's, it's gonna be me, it's my mouth, my smile, and my face still gonna be looking the same. If I had a choice, to take just a million dollars, but I can't buy teeth with it. I got to do everything else with it. Or just take these and forget the million dollars. Baby got teeth. No question. Period. Whoa, I got teeth! <laughs> <laughs> it's my mouth. Uh, the video is not working the way I wanted. But anyway, we ended up doing the smile design. We did, uh, gave her uh, the teeth of her dream. And that is, um, again, this are temporary same day. So I'm going to change the, uh, the a little bit to make it more <laughs> better. But just, just to give you a sense of what is possible. The, uh, Good. the Look at that. Look at that. Uh, at the office. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Again, ultimately, it comes down to this. It's a, it's the smiles, it's the photos, it's the emotions. It's, it's more than just teeth. And I think um, that example, and you can go to the website and see more of the video because I think on the period.com, Shane put that on there. Um, but ultimately, um, it's more than that. And the homework for all of you guys, I love for you guys to do this because we can stay connected. A lot. I like to know that you actually did this means a lot. If you haven't, uh, if you're not a photographer, if you've not done this, I love, I encourage you to do this. Take a picture of one of your team members or yourself and uh, use that, what you learned, the 567 portrait, the PCI, the template, create a smile design. It doesn't have to be the smile cloud. It could be Henry Shine's um, trios, it could be Plan Mecos, it could be Medit, it could be whatever. 
And then if you are able to design it and 3D print it, snap on instead of your smile design and tag me, or you could do whatever you could do. Again, that STL that you get is gold. You have that STL in your hands. You could do all kinds of things. I'm actually making, I probably, I'm going to, I love to make my upper teeth more exposed because I only show lower teeth because my lips so like it covers everything. So I like to do that for myself. And I, it's so easy. You just make a smile and do a print it and put it on your teeth. And, and, and make it and see it and see if you like it. And I, I think if you do that and tag us on Instagram, so that way we stay connected. And um, last but not least, let's take a second to thank again to Henry Shine for everything with the webinar. And then um, also for the links to the products, the articles, the courses and all the contents can be found. And this is the website that I was kept saying, drpeter.com slash HS or Henry Shine, that's where you can find all that stuff. So thank you so much for bearing with me. It's an hour and 31 minutes. I talked after a long day of surgery. So I'm so sorry if it wasn't all clear and rambled a whole lot, but thank you. Thank you. And um, God bless. So I'm here to see what, um, what's next. Great. Thank you, Dr. Peyre. We've got just a couple of questions for you. If you can hang tight for a little longer. Um, we will start from the end. So there was a comment saying, oops, just lost it. Uh, you're 3D printing those temps and not milling. What material are you using? I use a dental tooth model. Uh, that's from Asiga. Mm, there is another resin. So the one that I use right now is dental tooth model from Asiga. It's very good. I still like to do printed same day, but at the same time, I like to do meal and next week. I don't want the pretty uh, 3D printed material still to be in the mouth a long time because I have some patients that are out of town and I don't want them to go with the printed stuff. I like milling stuff yet for things that are going to be lasting a while. So with the milling material, I do PMMA if they're going to keep it long, but for a same day or a week out, 3D printed resin dental tooth model. Now I'm not saying it's going to break. I just feel more comfortable doing that. Great. And then can you clarify a little further what you mean by shooting raw? Shooting raw is when you want to take pictures from the camera. A camera, it asks you at the beginning in the setup where these pictures that you're taking, do you want to get them saved in what type of format do you want to save them? When you want to save, for example, uh, an Excel document, it's got .xcl, I think, or I don't know why I use Excel, but it just it has a .dot format or something. With a JPEG, it, JPEG is a very most common format of file uh, pictures being saved. However, when they do JPEG, the coloring might be different, and that's why RAW is the most authentic, original lighting that was captured by your camera. So that's what I meant by raw. Raw is the original, meaning nobody can mess with it. Nobody can turn it into, because my JPEG could look different in this computer than my JPEG would look on another computer because, in, and it's gonna look on different Samsung. And that's, that's why raw is the most authenticated form of um, a picture being captured on the camera. That's what I mean by that. Great, thank you. Got a couple question about pictures so first one how do you organize your photos do you use a software and then part two to that question why don't you store the pictures in the patient file so you could patient i mean as patients files are we talking in um like in their dental software management because the, sometimes the sizes of these photos could get extremely large and it's it's so hard as it is to just try to save some files in the open dental in terms of you know x-ray jpegs but you could, what I like to use, honestly, is Lightroom and my personal is uh, favorite is the SSD, like uh, being able to create a name and then um, uh, uh, first name, last name and have it organized like that. And that way you can always look through the SSD and click on it and quickly find them. If you're doing it on a computer that is on dental software, it's hard because you're going to have so many other things. That's why I wanted to, I want to make one computer to just be assigned to a media computer. This is the computer that is just used for photos. And that's why you, you can allow it to be more than just a computer because it's going to be used for multiple stuff, which is whenever you take the pictures, then that could be the computer that you also use to communicate with the lab. That could be the computer that you could communicate with your 
um, with your 3D printer. And if you want to design something with it in terms of a smile design, you could use that computer. But ultimately, what I use is uh, Lightroom and Photoshop to organize them. I also use Dropbox. I used to use Dropbox to be able to save like all these gigabytes. But easiest way for me after all of this is um, is this right here. Um, it's the and I have like forty five of these. It's so many uh, different things in here, and it's saved because you can always look through and find cases that are a long time ago. And if you want, you could always attach them to the patient's uh, files in the in the computer. Awesome. And then to answer your earlier question about what cameras people are using, there was a, a pretty solid mix between Canon and Nikon, but I think Canon got the slight edge. Nice. With that, I do want to thank you, Dr. Peyre, for your time this evening. If anyone has additional questions about tonight's topic, please email us at webinars at henryshine.com or go to drpeyre.com slash HS for information regarding this webinar series. Additionally, if you are interested in attending any other Henry Shine webinars, visit henryshinedental.com slash webinars for our upcoming schedule. I believe our next Dr. Perry webinar is in February sometime. No, March. I think it's oh, March. Oh, sorry. March. Don't Thank say you. February. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> I'm not, I haven't slept yet, but no, it's, um, it's, I'm excited, man. This is going to be a great year because I want to make all of these six series and then I want to meet everybody at DIA in Atlanta. So then we can talk and share stuff and meet in person again. So it's going to be fun. I'm excited. Thank you, Adam. And thank you, Andrea, and all the Henry Shine folks uh, for opportunity to present and be amongst all you guys. Thank you again. Great. Thank you. Well, keep your eyes out for the email coming for the March webinar. Um, as a thank you for attending tonight, everyone will receive this recording via email sometime in the next week. Uh, I'd like to thank you all again for joining us and hope to see you back here for part two. Thank you.